in the world. Is that going to be? On the 5th of March, a large fire burned through the Rohingya camp across Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh. At least 12,000 refugees are now homeless. More than a million Rohingya have fled to Bangladesh since Myanmar's military began its crackdown in 2017. The UN called it an example of textbook ethnic cleansing. The refugees don't have citizenship rights in Myanmar, nor do they have official status in Bangladesh. Last Sunday's fire happened as the Bangladeshi Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, attended the fifth United Nations Conference on the Least Developed Countries in Doha. Bangladesh is one of the 46 nations the UN considers the world's least developed, or those with less than $1,000 in annual income per capita. Though there has been significant social and economic progress since its independence war from Pakistan in 1971, many challenges remain including poverty, climate change, and political divisions. Today, Bangladesh is governed by none other than its founding father's daughter. 75-year-old Sheikh Hasina has been in office for more than 14 years. So, how is she facing the challenges brought on by the Rohingya refugee crisis? And as voters prepare for a general election later this year, we'll ask her about allegations of persecution of opposition members. The Bangladeshi Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, talks to Al Jazeera. Sheikh Hasina, Prime Minister of Bangladesh, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. We must start with the Rohingya situation, given the fire that has taken place there and the many thousands that have lost their homes. What's your reaction to that, first of all? And secondly, how can you reassure people and the million plus Rohingya refugees who live there that something is being done about their situation? Well, uh, when this incident started and people were tortured, murdered, then raped, so many things happened. We feel very bad. Then we open our door to influx them, to allow them to come, and we make all the arrangements for shelter, treatment, all these things on humanitarian ground. Side by side, we started talking to Myanmar also, that this, they are your citizen. You should take them back. Unfortunately, they are not responding very positively. Are you still talking to the still, uh, we are leadership talking, there? Yeah. By this time, many uh, international community, many countries come forward and assist. But it is almost five years. So I feel that uh, these people should go back to their own land, own home. But it's impossible because the, the security situation, and as you say, Myanmar, you can't even talk to them. Well, uh, in the international community, they are putting pressure on them, then, uh, the, but. It's really very difficult. Mm -hmm. And we have arranged accommodation in a separate place that is a good place and good accommodation in Vahashanchor. We developed the island and now about 30,000 family already uh, shifted there. Is it a good place? A lot very of people say place. it's very, very overcrowded and it's no, just no, basically it a silt good. island. Very good place and the good uh, housing and the uh, uh, good uh, arrangement for the children, their education and everything. We have made arrangement for their security, their health care, everything, every arrangement. But what about now, the living conditions generally? Because this fire has just taken place and, and thousands, 12,000 plus, are now displaced exactly. and homeless. Actually now in the camp, in Cox's Bazaar, situation is not very good, but now they have started fighting with each other, they indulge in different type of activities like um, drug trafficking, arm trafficking, human trafficking, and also they have their own conflicts, sometimes some um, murder or some other incident is happening, so I'm very much worried about it. And that's why I think that, and already we call upon the international community and also the organization like UNO and other 
organization related to that that who oh, please uh, um, cooperate with us and help these people so if we can take them that uh, place at least they will be safe and they will live a better life. That's what you've asked for, but the world has lost interest in the Rohingya, hasn't it? Is the international well, community doing enough? Do you want the international community to do more? You are very correct. During pandemic, COVID-19, yes, we, we, we assisted them all way, but this war become more difficult because the whole focus is now on the war and the refugee from Ukraine and all these things were so gradually not only that you know the whole worldwide the economic recession is there the inflation has been increased mm -hmm. so all the assistance is to come now gradually it is you know decreasing so then these people will be in future more problem. What do you say to those people who say that it's incumbent on Bangladesh as well as the international community but also incumbent on Bangladesh to do more, to give the refugees some kind of legal status, to give them freedom of movement, to give them access to livelihoods, to be able to work? Does that not have to happen to the, while they're still within the country? Well, uh, they are citizens of other country and they are refusing. But even then, all the facilities we have provided them. But we cannot create job opportunity or anything for them. Because our own people, they are also suffering. Not only that, the, there are environmental problems. Those areas where this camp, at this moment, that the camp is, at one time there were deep forests. Now almost the forest is gone. So that also creating the problem of environment. Mm -hmm. And then our local people, they are also suffering a lot. Okay, let's bring the discussion onto the reason why you're here in Doha uh, to attend the Least Developed Countries Summit. And you said when you addressed the summit, the countries, the LDCs, the Least Developed Countries, seek their Jews, not charity. What did you mean by that? Well, uh, I, I want to tell all the international community that this is our right. That, uh, we, have, we have been working and developing ourselves. Now, we graduated those countries, already we have graduated and more LDC country wants to develop themselves. So the international community and the developed country uh, monetary institution, they should come forward to assist them, cooperate them. So it is their right. LDC's country, as because we are graduating ourselves, so it is our right to get all kind of cooperation. That's what I mean. Bangladesh itself is, is due to graduate at some point in 2026, I think, from the LDCs, from the Least Developed Countries Group. And there's no doubt that Bangladesh has made remarkable progress since independence. The country grew at 7% in the years before COVID, which is only slightly lower than China. Its GDP per person is higher than India's. Power plants are going up. It's a metro going up in, in Dhaka. What's driving this, this impetus? Listen, actually in Bangladesh, uh, if you see that our resources are very limited. But I can tell you one thing that our people, I must say they are wonderful people, very resilient people, but it depends on your policy. What we did, we take a proper plan and according to that, we prepare the perspective plan, long-term plan, mid-term, short-term and immediate. Right, and it's, it's come to fruition and it's had yes, some effect. and that way gradually we started our uh, I mean, making our progress. Okay, there's there's a great reliance, isn't there, on the garment industry, on uh, manufacturing clothes and so forth. But that's precarious to have so much reliance on one element. What else are you doing within the country to build a more solid economic footing, especially as we advance into the 
new areas of technology? The first thing, our priority was, through research, we started growing our food, and we make sure that food security our people should get. Then education, healthcare, all these basic needs, side by side, how to develop and create job opportunity. What I did, I opened up everything in the private sector. Yes, government sector is there, but I opened every corner for private sector. We encouraged our people. We invited foreign investment as well as our domestic inv investment. And the younger generation also we encouraged. And 2008 election, our manifesto we declared that Bangladesh will be uh, digital Bangladesh. That means the ICT sector. We get more importance to ICT sector. Now all over Bangladesh, Wi-Fi is available. The you know submarine cable through and broadband we reach our people. Now we started producing electricity. Now I can tell you that whole country, each and every house, they get. Electricity. It is not. But there, better, but there but are but power cuts, also, aren't there? There yeah, are frequent power, power cuts. The but, but one thing. Energy. Okay, so we've we've come up to this level, and it's, no, Bangladesh I, I, is, is doing you. well. But suddenly, so, suddenly, Prime Minister, there's this cost of living crisis. Foreign currency reserves they've slumped to under thirty billion dollars. You've taken a nearly five billion dollar loan from the IMF. People are struggling to make ends meet, and there's people protesting on the streets. How are you going to reverse that? Listen. Um, our monetary policy is very uh, time-bound and pragmatic. As I told you, that first thing you educate your people, create job opportunity. They will, you know, they will create their own future. And secondly, the communication, electricity, then Wi-Fi connection. We launch our satellite. So that creates job opportunity all over the country. And now it doesn't help immediately though, does it? There's an immediate problem, isn't there? The, no, I'm telling you that gradually we are making progress. So our uh, garments is one sector. Side by side in our export basket, now like we started producing our uh, like any kind of food, then our company law, we changed that even one person, they can open a company. We started a startup program, and all over Bangladesh, we establishing incubation center, high tech park. So ICT and uh, digital device, this is our next target to export and create job opportunity okay. for our people. So there are, there are opportunities. There are opportunities. I'm telling you, just let me finish, please. Now, about monetary system, side by side, we are adjusting our you know, uh, monetary policy so that our, our people, common people, should not suffer much. There is still discontent on the streets. We're going to come back to that yeah. in a second because I want to tension move on. I want to move on to. I want to move on to, to climate change uh, because when most people think about Bangladesh, they may think of a nation you know perpetually flooded and cyclones and so forth. The effects of cyclones made a whole lot worse by climate change, which is true. But there is a flip side to that because Bangladesh has made fantastic advances in adapting to climate change. Can you tell us about those? The kind of things that have happened. Yes, but our geographical position, our people suffer from cyclone, tidal bore, flood, cyclone. It's true, but we know how to deal with And we have our preparedness. In the cyclone prone area, we are building cyclone resistance house and also started developing all these islands so that our people can uh, I mean, live in a better way. Then our cyclone shelter, this is multi-purpose. When cyclone comes, immediately we can reach to the people. We train 85,000 volunteers during any natural disaster. Immediately they go to the people, evacuate people, we give shelter. So that way we help them. Even when there is, you know, a flood, 
we also help our people. We also preparing by, by building flood shelter, and our Bangladesh. We have so many river. You know, we started the dressing the river so that river can hold more water. That also help us for cultivation and mm -hmm. during flood time the river can hold more water so it does not flood it That's right. the land. That way we have New our farming techniques preparedness and so forth. for climate change. Mm -hmm. so for nevertheless, climate change and sea level rise is remorseless, isn't it? And there will be migration inland in the future. How are you preparing for that? No, I told you that all the coastal belt area, those area may be affected uh, is if the sea level uh, rise even one meter. So those area we have taken a special program for development so that our people don't need to migrate and artificial mangrove and creating green belt to save our country from those uh, calamities. Prime Minister, let's move on to the elections. Elections coming up at the end of the year. And it's interesting because in the Western media, uh, there are two words that are most frequently used to describe you, and you'll forgive me for saying them, they are autocratic leader. But how would you describe yourself? Autocratic, me. Mm. Those Western media or your Al Jazeera, if you want to tell me autocratic government, then my question is, when our country run by military dictator, how do you explain that? those who are not elected by people. In 1975, 15th August, my father, Father of Darshan Bangabadu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the then president, was brutally murdered, not only him, my mother, my three brothers, my two sister-in-laws, my uncle, all together 18 members were killed. And then the power was captured by the military dictator, violating the constitution, violating the army rules, and they run the country. From there, through long struggle, we bring back democracy, we establish people's voting right, we establish that, uh, and also not only that, we also make people aware about the power, people's power. I understand what you're saying, but let's bring it forward to today the then United Nations High Commissioner, uh, Michelle Bachelet for Human Rights, she came to Bangladesh and she expressed her concern about allegations of forced disappearances, extrajudicial killings, torture, and the lack of accountability for such violations. And she called for an independent investigation. Have you held an investigation into those Listen, allegations? Listen, yes, of course. Uh, any incident happened, immediately we take action and we bring them to book and but why, why, are they, why does try, Human Rights Watch, for example, they say there's a con continuing campaign of threats and intimidation yes. against human rights defenders. This is only in January this year. I know that. I know that there are some people, intentionally they do it, because 2009, when I from government, till now, we have continuous democratic process in our country, and that's why the country made tremendous progress economically, socially, culturally. Look, our poverty level was 41% in 2005, 2006. Now we reduced to 20%. Our GDP, it was very low. Now it has increased. Now, before COVID-19, we achieved 8.1%, but because of pandemic, now it's reduced, but still... But that, that doesn't, forgive me, that doesn't account percent. for people disappearing or I'm being killed, telling you, I'm telling you, who are they? You should know it. Now, our literacy rate, it was only 45%, now it's gone to 75.2%. If we indulge in this uh, violation of human rights and all these things, then how could we make all this progress? Mm. Well, they now, are protesting the on the streets, is, aren't they? But if we come, so they will have a chance. They will you, those, have a chance to vote listen, at the end of this year, aren't who, they? The elections are coming up. Listen, and those you've, you've who, said you want no, free I'm, and fair I'm, elections. Let me finish, please. Is that right? Those who are talking about all these things, who are they? You first, you have to find them out. They don't want that this country should get a stable progress 
and stable economic development. They always prefer unconstitutional government so that then they can get a chance. Okay, Prime Minister, we need so to get that is We're, we're going to run thing. out of time. Let's, in, in, can we just come back to the elections? Time, listen, the elections coming no, no, up. I, I, I'm, I insist no, we, we have no, to we no, have no, to. I want on. to tell you one thing. What is my position? When my whole family was assassinated, I couldn't come back to my country, neither my sister, neither our other relatives. We, we had to live as a refugee outside the country. When I returned home, do you know I had no right to file a case against the murderer? Because all those murderers, they got in indemnity. Right. They are united. So I, when I become prime minister, only after that, we change that law. You yourself have said, of course, that you want free and fair elections. Now, there was, as you know, a system in Bangladesh whereby elections, when they were due, a, an interim caretaker government would take over uh, and would oversee the election. And that was in place until you came in power, into power in 2009, and then it was abolished. Now the opposition are calling for that process to be <laughs> restored. So will you allow it? Will you allow an interim caretaker government to oversee the election so that everybody can see that they're free and fair? Listen, we had very bad experience uh, about the caretaker government. And now those parties who want the caretaker government, actually, they distorted the system. They distorted the system. It is not me. And the caretaker government in the past, who are they? When BNP was in power 2001, they not only violated the human rights, they killed people, they destroyed our country, destroyed economy, the country, five times this country become a corrupt country. So many people, not only that, I myself, I am also a victim. They tried to kill me several times. There was again an attack in open daylight. 22 of my uh, party members have been killed, including the women leader, Abhi Rahman. And there was no justice, no inquiry, nothing. And not only that, their corruption. It is not only me, even from foreign country, it was proved. So, and then terrorism. 500 places, there was a bomb blasted in the country within one hour. I must say that they wanted to create Bangladesh. They wanted to create Bangladesh a failed state. Okay, so, so then, this time round, you're, you're just going to proceed their, with the elections listen, in the normal because way. Because of their misdeed, then there was an emergency. We're, we're so running I, out of time I now. can tell you I know, one I thing. I have established people's voting right. I have so this, established this time democracy. Round, when, when the election comes up at the end of this year, can you guarantee that they will be free and of fair course, and they will be observed? Of course, 100%. Because the last two sets of elections, no, they haven't been, last have they? two elections, they may raise the question, but they could prove it. There was a proper election and people voted for my party because 2014 election, BNP didn't participate. Why? Who are their leader? They are all punished because of the corruption, arms smuggling, mm -hmm. or gained attack. Okay. So, even their constitution, party constitution, it is there that anybody, anybody implicated in corruption or nepotism or terrorism, mm -hmm. they cannot. We're running out of time now. One final question to you. Your father, who you've mentioned a lot, regarded as the, the founding father of Bangladesh, as you said, he was assassinated in 1975 along with many members of your family. When you set out on this long career of leading your country, I think 19 years you've been prime minister overall, I'm sure you've had him in mind much of that time. What do you think, honestly, that he would make of your leadership? Well, my father is no more, but I follow his ideology. I try to serve people the way he wanted to serve. 
I care for my people the way he used to care. From 2009 to 2023, country has been changed a lot. I hope it is my father's blessings is there. As because of my father's blessings, of me, that's why I could do this and I could make this progress. So definitely from heaven, my father is very happy that yes, at least he can see that yes, I am helping his poor people. Sheikh Hasina, Prime Minister of Bangladesh, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you very much. <laughs>